Awesome. Welcome so much to the most fantastic webinar that I am so excited to share with you because I love it. I love digestion. I love the gut. I love everything about this. And tonight we are going to go over what we like to call the healthy gut. Now, guys, I know that there has been a lot of change happening over the last couple weeks and it's a lot of information. And the reason why Briar and I like to kind of give it in stages is that if we bombard you all off at the beginning with way too much overwhelming information, it's almost like, what the heck, where are we even starting from? So that's why I can't love this webinar anymore because it's building upon what we're already going over. So again, when we speak so wholeheartedly about the challenge, when we say challenge friendly, guys, I know you've been looking at your ingredient list and really making such a conscious effort on, on making some challenge friendly food choices and moving your body more and all these things, which is so absolutely wonderful. So first off, I need to congratulate you because you're at least, you're over halfway. So I always say if you're over halfway, you're laughing because now it should be really quite, of quite a new habit for you, which is so awesome. So again, it takes a little while off the beginning for your body to get used to these new foods and all that kind of great stuff, but now your body's starting to settle in. So that's why I love the webinar at this time frame in the challenge, because it's going to build upon everything you have already been doing and hopefully the changes you have already been noticing. And this is just going to really hone in on some really key points that I think there is going to be, for me, guys, I'm going to be really, really honest. This is um, re information that's kind of new and up and coming, and, and I mean, some of you have probably already heard a lot of these terms, but it's just really coming to the forefront of a lot of the medical literature and a lot of different stats and studies are coming out to support everything that we're kind of doing, and it's such, a, it's such an important time to be making such wonderful changes within your food and, and uh, inevitably within the internal system of your body. Because a lot of times what happens is we get very, I shouldn't say fixated on your exterior shell, but a lot of times what we're doing is thinking, oh, you know, um, I'm hoping, you know, to shed a couple pounds and I want my body to get toned and trim and lean and mean and all of that. But what is so cool is that what you are doing is affecting so much more than your external shell. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So my very first slide is a word that maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't heard, but what is the microbiome? Now, you're probably scratching your head going, Vaughn, I've never even heard that term microbiome. What the heck are you even talking about? So this is a little bit of a biology anatomy lesson tonight, that it is gonna be so prevalent to how your body's functioning. I promise you this is not to be missed. So microbiome, it is making reference or talking about all the microbes that live on or in the body. And you go, well, what the heck is a microbe? What are these things in the first place? Guys, I'm talking about the bacteria, the viruses, the protozoa, all of the trillions, trillions of microbes that live on our skin, in our hair, uh, in our nasal passages, in our gut, underneath our nails, in our mouths. It, it, it is, we are actually, this is crazy, get ready for this one. We are actually more bacteria than we are human. And you're gonna go, well, now, now you're crazy because that seems like a little bit uh, of a space invaded body. But guys, in our gut, our gut microbiome, has about, and let me reference my notes because I think it is about 10 to one. So it's about 10 trillion. Let me just clarify that. I wanna make sure I have those stats right. Um, yes, you have about 10 trillion bacteria in your gut, which actually outweighs our human cells 10 to one. So really, we're more bacteria. So why are we not talking about our bacteria? Why are we not taking care of our bacteria? Why are we not focusing on this? And this is really what tonight's episode is about because this is really gonna hone in on all of this about digestion and disease and looking at autoimmune disease and things like that. So when I'm talking about digestion, guys, 
digestion is a lot of things. We're going to hone in on something in particularly in the gut. But when, we, when, when you hear people talk about digestion, I want to just show this slide because digestion starts in the mouth. So it kind of travels down, as you can see in the diagram here. You're, you're chewing your food, good. It's like you're, you're starting to break down your food. Your digestion starts instantaneously. So it's your food's digesting, it's going down your esophagus, terrific, it's going into your stomach, and then it's going into your small intestine where you're doing a lot of what your your body's doing a lot of absorbing through there. So a lot of our nutrients that we're trying to grasp is in our colon and our small intestine. What we are trying to do is really have the healthiest I guess you would say, I, I love to use the word gut because, guys, your gut is really what is so important. And how I said before, those 10 trillion, 10 trillion bacteria in your gut is really what is, is in the utmost importance when it comes to overall health and well-being and when it comes to things like autoimmune disease. So autoimmune disease, a lot of times you might hear people that maybe have Crohn's, maybe they've got colitis, um, also some uh, lupus, uh, MS is an autoimmune disease, but you also may hear people that are having like terrible allergies and acneic problems and all of these things which seem so crazy that it can be affected by our gut bacteria, but I am here to tell you it is positively affected by your gut microbiome. So this little picture here is the little guys that we're going to be talking about today, which is my favorite little uh, gut bacteria, and there they are right inside there, all of your little worker bees. Okay, let's take your human body. So we have our entire human body, and that body I want you to think of as a factory. So here we are as a factory. Inside your factory, you have different departments. So maybe you've got an HR department, maybe you've got a heavy machinery department. You've got all different departments within your factory. That's the same thing in our bodies. We've got our lungs, we've got our digestion, we've got your, um, I mean, there's so many different systems in your body. Your heart has to pump, your muscles need to contract. Everything needs to function properly. And what happens is you need worker bees in order to do that. You need your employees working in your company. You need little worker bees working inside your body. And guys, that is really what your bacteria is there for. And without your bacteria, we wouldn't have all these other process processes happen in our body. It wouldn't happen. It needs your bacteria to make all of these byproducts in order for all other functions to happen. So if your bacteria is not doing its job or your bacteria is almost in um, disarray, where there's not a healthy balance in your bacteria between your good and your bad bacteria, what happens is your body starts to almost attack, it, attack itself. So that's a, a lot of times when we speak about autoimmune, autoimmune diseases mean you're attacking your own body. That's, it's, it, it's, that's what it's doing. So if you're attacking your own body, what's happening is the gut, or sorry, not even just the gut bacteria, but your bacterial is a little bit imbalanced. So maybe you have a little bit more of the bad bacteria versus the good bacteria, and then it creates a lot of chaos in the body. So in order for us to really kind of grasp our mind around what is the gut microbiome, and how does it even form, and all of these trillions of cells, where are they even coming from in the first place? So there's, there's a couple points, and, and I really want to talk wholeheartedly about the last two, but I'm going to bring up the first two just because they're pretty darn important, and I know that in the end, we're already born, and we were already either breastfed or not breastfed, and in the end, there's nothing we can change with our own beings when it comes to something like that. But I want to take a couple of minutes to explain why this is so dire, dire important. So when you are um, being born, ideally you are being born vaginally. And the reason why I say that, there is so much scientific data just, uh, just giving so much validity to a vaginal birth rather, rather than a C-section birth. Now, when it comes to a vaginal birth, the baby is moving through the birth canal. And when the baby is moving through the birth canal, what the baby is getting is being coated with the mother's vaginal microbiome. So 
you want that. The baby needs that. That's how it's going to be starting kind of the, the best, like if you're sending your, if you are actually, for any employees, if you are expecting or if you haven't had any children yet and you know that you're going to be having, you're hoping to have babies in the future, it is so important to really kind of understand this concept. So when the baby's coming out, that last little, like, gulp before they come into the world, they're gulping in and they're taking in the microbiome of the mother. And what happens is they swallow their microbes. Those, those last little bit of gulp of microbes go into the baby, and then it starts to cultivate a healthy gut bacteria. And, and that's really where it starts from. So I like to give the example, you might think your most important day of life is when maybe you're heading off to college or maybe you are got that really awesome job, but really the greatest, um, most influential day of your life is when you're born and hopefully you were born vaginally. If you were not, it is not a death sentence. I'm just saying that in the end, it gives you, you know, it, it gives you a little bit more robust community. And um, also when there's a lot of stats coming out right now with babies that are born by a C-section in Canada, I think we're one in four um, by a C-section in the United States, our poor United States. Um, they're about one in three right now, which is really, really crazy that um, C-sections are creeping up, you know, more, it's just, C-section after C-section after C-section when really now the stats are coming out that it makes such an important um, impact on the baby if they're born vaginally when it comes to autoimmune disease, when it comes to a lot of, uh, not just autoimmune, but also when it comes to, oh goodness, a lot of uh, asthmas and allergies and things like that. They're showing the stats that vag vaginal born babies just have a stronger immunity and it is all due to this microbiome. So number one, again, if you were not born vaginally, what can you do? This is as good as it gets, you move on from there. Then here comes the next big point is breastfed babies. So again, if you are expecting, if you are thinking about having a baby and kind of the importance of breastfeeding and not breastfeeding, guys, in breast milk, it's pretty, I guess you would say that a lot of times they'll say it's like nature's perfect food, and it really is. And I'm going to give a little bit of a stat. I think you're going to find this kind of cool. Inside of breast milk, there is something called an oligosaccharide. Now, what that is, it is only found in breast milk. You cannot get it in formula, but the oligosaccharide is not there to feed or nourish the baby, per se. It's not food for the baby, but what it is, is inside it is feeding the baby's, you named it, gut bacteria. So the baby's gut microbiome, gut bacteria, it needs to grow and it needs to repopulate and it needs to get robust. And in the end, the food that the baby, or the, sorry, that the gut bacteria needs is those oligosaccharides. It's only in breast milk. So I can't really stress it enough how important that is. Again, if you've already had your children and you didn't breastfeed and maybe they were born by a C-section, I do not, this, this seminar is not to make you feel guilt and go, oh my gosh, why did I not do this? Guys, this is research that's really being um, in the forefront over the last five years, very, very strong cases and, and case studies and things like that. So don't feel like that's the be all and end all, but if you are moving in that direction and maybe having a baby in the near future, it is something really to think about and just kind of food for thought when um, starting the, starting a baby off on its, I guess you would say right foot, uh, more, most, uh, micro, most healthy microbiome right foot. But uh, the next one, get ready for this one, you're gonna love it because it's interesting and I always feel like the more information we can absorb and kind of work into our world and all this kind of stuff is just really going to help in your overall health because what, what we care about is your health. So how can we bring your health to the most optimal level? Um, the overuse of antibiotics. Now, remember I said there's all those 10 trillion gut bacteria. Antibiotics, a very um, robust antibiotic that is really, a lot of times they'll call them a broad spectrum antibiotic that's there to kind of kill everything, kills one third of your gut bacteria. And you go, what? How could it do that? 
guys, it's because it's supposed to kill. That's what that's what the that's what this antibiotic is doing. It's antibacteria. It is killing it all. And unfortunately, it is killing the bad with the good. It's doing all of it. So it kind of just does a big clean sweep if you can kind of picture it in that way. So a lot of times if you think of filling up a bathtub, I'm going to go into probiotics and kind of how to help your gut bio, gut microbiome or your gut bacteria afterwards. But I'm going to give a little bit of analogy now. If you take a you take a, a bath and you fill it all up with water and then you drain that water out, like completely drain it out, and then you add a little bit back in. That's kind of what we're doing when we take an antibiotic. It's like just it is a cleaning house. Everything's gone. And then even if you do take a really robust probiotic, you're only putting in a little bit of that good bacteria back in, and then you're hoping that catches. So, and you might go, what do you mean that catches? I'm going to describe that later on. But the overuse of antibiotics is definitely something it's creeping up quite a bit right now. Um, there's a lot of research suggesting it's the over it's almost the overdiagnosis, and I almost feel bad for the physicians because I'm going to explain something. When you're going to the doctor for yourself, for your children, whatever, when you're going to the doctor, the doctor feels almost this need to fix or need to heal. I mean, obviously, that's what the doctor's there for. So in our kind of um, society, I guess you would say, we're going to the doctor to say, here, fix me, heal me. So the doctors almost have their hands tied where they feel like they need to prescribe in order to make the client or patient um, happy. And I don't want you to kind of go in with that, with that almost predisposition that that's what you're looking for. So I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. Absolutely go to the doctor if you're feeling ill, the kids are feeling ill, bring them to the doctor. But maybe it would be kind of a, a good thought process to go in with before, you know, you're, you're, don't expect a prescription at the end. And I know that might seem a little bit odd at first because we're, we're so used to this over prescribing, this over prescribing all the time and we're, we're kind of conditioned to think, oh, that's going to be the end result and there's going to be a pill to fix the ill. When really I would love you to go in with an open mind and be able to have an open line of communication with your physician and just you know, obviously you want to get swabbed and tested and see what's growing in there and maybe if it is a strep infection or something like that, you've got a cough, your throat's bothering you, get the culture back. Get the culture back to say, hey, was it something that it really was a, um, a, an infection that an antibiotic could actually treat? Because what stats are showing right now, and I know this is crazy, but stats are showing that antibiotics are being prescribed that patients um, 70 to 80 percent of the time when it really was viral. And I know that seems nuts, but it was a viral infection in the first place. It was not a bacterial infection, which the antibiotic is going to do something for you anyway. So by running through your course of antibiotics with pretty much the same time frame that you know, that you're just getting some rest and having some fluids that your virus would have kind of run its course at the same time. But it's, it's, again, it's food for thought. It's just I'm planting a little bit of a seed to put the onus back on us and, and really take our own health into our hands and, and not, you know, throw it out there to the physician and say, here, fix me, when in the end, there's a lot of things you can do for yourself to really kind of go in with a strong immunity, especially into cold and flu season. And I know for us right now it's winter, so there's a lot of stuff going around right now. So, okay. Those are three kind of key points. My last key point that is absolutely disrupting our gut bacteria, and I mean not even disrupting, I'm talking about like blowing it up. It's like it is just creating such terrible havoc in our system, and that is Processed food, the processed food because a lot of times it's lacking fiber. That's gigantic, and I'm going to get into that because you're going to love it. So prepare yourself for the love. But it's the processed food, so now it is nutrient poor. There's nothing. There's no no greatness left to that food whatsoever. Plus the added sugar. Now, guys, that's why it's so. I want to talk about it now because this is just going to. 
be that real aha moment. And I know you have been ridding yourself of the extra added sugar because you're over halfway into the challenge. So your body is, you kicked it. You kicked that habit. But when it comes to the extra added sugar, too much sugar, added sugars, added sugar, processed food, what that is doing is food for the bad bacteria. So remember I said at the beginning, if you have this terrible imbalance where your bad bacteria excuse me, is actually um, outnumbering the good bacteria. That's actually what food poisoning is. When you have more bad bacteria than good bacteria, that's what violent food process, I mean, uh, food poisoning is. So you do not, you still want a little bit of bad bacteria. You're not going to be free from it. But what you do want is the better, healthier, good bacteria. And you need that real good balance in play in order to keep your body functioning in your most optimal state when it comes to staying healthy and keeping a really robust immune system and being able to digest your food. Because if without your digestion, you're not getting the nutrients that you actually need to thrive. And a lot of times we are so depleted and we can't absorb our nutrients. Why, guys? Because your food wasn't even broken down properly because our bacteria was not getting fed the proper food. Now, kind of look at yourself as um, almost as like a little bit of a, I shouldn't even say like your own test guinea pig, but I want you to keep trying to learn your body as much as possible and what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And what I can say works for, I don't even want to say 100% of the population, but I am going to say that so much of us, especially in North America, what we are is fiber deprived. So a lot of times when we're talking about things like, you know when I'm talking about whole grains and I say, guys, look for that, that outer bran layer on the whole grains. That's the fiber. That's the greatness. When I'm talking about fiber, I'm talking about this magnificent fiber in fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds and legumes and beans and eat it up. And what happens is our food is so, again, nutrient depleted. So everything's stripped away or cooked away and it's all of that that our body isn't even getting the proper nutrients in order to nourish our nourish ourselves properly. So the fiber is so gigantically important. I cannot stress it enough. And I'm going to explain why the fiber is so important when it comes to your gut microbiome. But just looking from a fiber perspective, guys, fiber for our for our females, what I would, the recommendations is that uh, right now, they're saying 25 grams of fiber per day for a female. For our males, they're suggesting to have 38 grams of fiber. Just a second, I'm going to take a sip of tea. Now, when it comes down to the fiber recommendations, that's wonderful and terrific. I would love to even see probably another 10 grams added to both. So 35 grams for a female, almost 40 grams for a male. I'm telling you, this is the most nutso stat ever in the typical standard American diet. And when I say standard American diet, I love that acronym because look at those letters right now. Look at it. Look at it. What does it say? It says sad. That's nuts. And it could not be any better because the standard American diet is sad. It's sad, it's disgusting, and it's ridiculously wrong. And unfortunately, it's depleted of a lot of nutrients, but what it's depleted most of is fiber. So typically, they're saying North Americans are having about 12 grams of fiber a day. So the minimum, minimum requirement that uh, the World Health Organization is suggesting us to have, again, 25 grams for a female, 38 grams for a male, Guys, that is so crazy that we are getting 12, roughly 12 grams of fiber. So the importance of fiber, there's two different types of fiber that we're going to talk about. There's a soluble fiber and an insoluble fiber. So I'm going to describe the two. The reason why I'm speaking today so wholeheartedly, so hardcore about fiber, is that fiber is really where it's at. So if I look at kind of the challenge-friendly guidelines. The challenge-friendly guidelines means whole foods 
without any extra added sugar. So when we say whole foods, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the oats, the barley, the flax, the chia, the beans, the vegetables, the fruit, all of it. It's whole foods because what you're gaining from a whole food is the fiber component. And really, that is what's going to make a difference in your digestion. It's going to make a difference on, oh, my gosh, it, it plays such an important role in a healthy lifestyle. So looking at soluble fiber. Soluble fiber means this. You eat it, it is absorbed, it is soluble in water. So soluble fiber, think of this. Think of soluble fiber as a sponge. So if you take your soluble fiber, here's your sponge, you're going to put it in your water, and it's soaking up the water. What soluble fiber is going to do is run through your digestive tract, and it is going to be soaking up a lot of the toxins. It's soaking up a lot of the bad cholesterol. It's almost like your sponge for everything that you're trying to rid yourself of. So it's the sponge. You need the sponge to get the impurities. You need that sponge in order to get the bad cholesterol. You need that sponge. You need your soluble fiber. What also is cool about fiber, guys, is that it slows how much sugar goes into your bloodstream. So say, for instance, if you have a smoothie, this is awesome. I'm going to say it twice, guys. Solu or sorry, fiber in itself will slow the surge of sugar into your bloodstream. So you take your fiber. Here's your smoothie. You make a smoothie, and in that smoothie, it has some fruit in the smoothie. Okay, terrific. You've got your fruit to make it taste a little, a little good. Maybe you've got a banana. Maybe you've got half a banana. Maybe you've got maybe five strawberries. Great. You've got your fruit. In order for your body to not be too much of, an, of a sugar high, adding fiber into that will slow how quickly the sugar enters into your bloodstream. So a really awesome tip is adding in some chia seeds into your smoothie. Because by adding in some chia seeds into your smoothie, what is chia seeds? Chia seeds is the fiber. Chia seeds is the soluble fiber. I cannot tell you how important that is. Now, what's even crazier, add another superpower food into that smoothie is kale. Look a little bit further down on your screen, you see an insoluble fiber. Insoluble fiber means your body can't, your body can't digest that. Your body cannot absorb them. It does not dissolve in water. So, Kale is a perfect example of a bulking agent. So kale, you're going to get the nutrients from it, but kale is a wonderful insoluble fiber to add into your smoothie as well. So I love the concept, and I, I was um, doing some research the other day, and I was listening to a doctor speak. I'm going to send this off in a note, in a, in a, in a link at the bottom. Guys, this is so, she is just incredible. Her name is Dr. Robin Chuchkan, and she is um, an integrative gastroenterologist, and she is out of Washington, D.C., but I'm taught, this, this woman is absolutely genius. I don't even know how I got onto that topic. I don't even know where I was going with that, but anyways, Robin's the love of my life, and um, she has so much cool ideas on how to kind of put things together and really how to help strengthen your immune system. But when it does come down to kale, adding kale and chia seeds into that smoothie is going to help you um, not only give you the fiber that you need, but it will also take the sugar grams that are going to be in your fruit, which we love, but it's going to help it slow the digestion process so that the sugar isn't, you know, taking a a big glass of fruit juice and blah, 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 drinking it, and then now it goes right as a sugar surge right into your bloodstream. So remember how we talked at the beginning of the challenge. I want you to have as even keeled blood sugar levels as possible. I don't want you spiking up high, and I don't want you dropping down too low. So you're just staying nice and even, and by staying nice and even, you need that fiber. You need the soluble fiber, but you also need the insoluble fiber. So insoluble, insoluble, Soluble fiber means, again, it's, it's not it's soluble in water. It is not digested by your small intestine. What the insoluble fiber is the greatest thing of your life, the insoluble fiber is really there as food. But it's not food for you. It is food for the love of my life, which is your gut bacteria. 
your gut bacteria needs insoluble plant fiber. That's what it feeds on. So I'm talking about kale, bananas, onions, leafy greens. Did you hear me, challengers? Leafy greens, leafy greens. Good God, we love our leafy greens. But also really stringy fiber like asparagus and celery and things that are very stringy. Those stringy fiberness uh, material is not digested, and that is the food in order to feed our healthy gut bacteria. And like I said before, sugar feeds the bad bacteria. We need to feed the good bacteria in order for them to function properly. If we are eating, again, I'm going to go back up a slide, if we're eating that, that terrible, sad diet, the standard American diet, we're losing all of that. And by losing all of that, we are not living up to our optimal level. And we're asking our body to kind of go through all these processes without actually having the proper nutrients in play. And I mean, you wouldn't send, um, you wouldn't send somebody off to work in a new job and say, hey, you know what, um, you're a doctor today. I know you used to be a plumber, but today you're a doctor and we are giving you absolutely no training and we're not giving you the proper materials in order to even know what the heck you're doing, but oh, there you go. Go off, go on your day. It doesn't work like that. So guys, think about that in your digestive system as well. You can't expect your body to be functioning at this optimal level if what you're fueling yourself is not proper. And in the end, you think that food is fuel. I cannot say it enough. It is, as soon as you get that concept, it's like, okay, you know what? That makes sense. So if you're foregoing a lot of the extra added sugars and you're like, you know what? I'm pretty cool. Maybe you don't. Oh, this is where, okay. It's, it all came back to me. Dr. Robin, who's my love. Dr. Robin, I was listening to a, a podcast she was giving the other day. And what she said in her podcast was that she loves the, loves the idea, and I think this is genius, to add in, I'm going to reverse up a slide just so that you can see this again. She said, why don't we try to have a one, two, three rule? And I'm like, one, two, three rule? What does that even mean? What she's saying is, how about let's get in um, a vegetable, one, two, and three. So one with breakfast, two with lunch, three with dinner. That is such an awesome way to look at it. So for breakfast, when we're having a smoothie, put in a handful of spinach or put in a handful of kale. Get your vegetable in your smoothie. If you're making yourself maybe some scrambled eggs or something like that, saute in some a little bit of um, spinach as well, just to try to get in a vegetable with breakfast. Try it even for a week, guys. I think this is an awesome idea. For lunch, maybe you had a salad, a leafy green salad. Maybe you had some um, maybe you had some spinach or some kale with your salad, but maybe you had some chopped up cucumber, maybe you had some red pepper, something that's raw. So two with your lunch, but then also, you know, again, maybe you have a grilled piece of chicken in there, maybe you have some beans or some lentils, just something to get in some type of protein as well. So that's your two. For dinner, guys, this is what I love. I want you to make yourself a salad with dinner every single day. Now, I know salads, I don't want you to think salads has to be in our typical kind of, you know, just a leafy green and maybe you, it's, get creative with it, guys. So again, maybe you uh, shred up some cabbage, maybe you shred up some apple, and maybe you shred up some carrots. And that's the base of your salad. And then maybe you're building it onto it from there. Maybe you made a tahini dressing. Maybe you were, you know, pressed for time and did some balsamic vinegar and olive oil. Just something that's going to dress it up. But get is so you have your, you know, your salad always with your dinner. And then maybe you've got some steamed asparagus. Maybe you've got some kale, or sorry, maybe you've got some broccoli. Um, the other day I did a very light saute of kale. And I'm telling you, it was so fantastic just to break down the fibers, just to, to break down the fibrous tissue, or sorry, the fibrous leaves a little bit so it wasn't so um, gritty, I guess you would say. And it was a quick saute. So I did a little bit of coconut oil in my pan. I also had some really, ah, I should have brought them into the webinar, but they're like really like thick, long pieces of um, coconut. And those are like my croutons in a way. So I started to saute down those a little bit just to toast them up. 
and then I dump in my kale, and I chop up my kale leaves extremely fine. Do not take that stem in the center. Uh, it will be too gritty for you if you're having it in a salad or something like that. You can blend, you can um, put it in the blender if you wanted to, but it'll be too grainy to eat in a salad. But anyways, I took the kale leaves, chopped them up really fine, 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 and then I just tossed that in, toasted it up a little bit, and then I added that as the base of my dish, and then I added all of this greatness on top. I did a sweet potato, I had some salmon on the side, um, and that was my dinner. So really get creative. And I think sometimes what we can do is get stuck in a rut. So that's why I take this last kind of half of the challenge to really experiment a little bit. This is second nature to you right now. And if you keep throwing things in and experiment with it a little bit, I promise you, it's like you're taking your health even just that much, just even just taking it a little bit further. And throwing in things like the chia seeds will really, really help to get in that extra fiber. So. That was Robin, um, Dr. Robin's idea on doing the one, two, three when it comes to the vegetables. I just, I think that's genius. And it's really simplistic. And the reason why I love simplistic concepts is because, guys, food is supposed to be a lifestyle. I think what happened was we got so high tech that it was like, we don't even know what's good anymore. So pull it all back. If we can get back to the basics as much as possible, I promise you that is where you're really going to notice a huge difference on being able to maintain because it's not it's not a big deal. Make it a non-big deal. Make it, ah, you know what, that makes sense to me. It makes common sense. I'm going to keep going with it. So this is the really great part. How do you build a healthy gut garden? So this is what I want you to picture. Your gut, your digestive system is your garden. So in order, if you were having a garden in your backyard, you would have to give it the right fertilizer. You'd have to give it the right soil. You'd have to give it the right food in order for it to grow. So I want you to keep thinking of that same exact concept. So when we're trying to build a healthy gut garden, there's three really kind of big keys. I'm going to throw in a fourth key that is not on this slide, but you're going to know exactly where I'm going with the fourth key. So also, guys, Please type in any questions uh, that are happening along the way because I'm talking extremely fast because I want to get through this material because I love it more than life. So the first thing you can do to build a healthy gut garden is fermented food. So you might hear that these days. Fermented foods is getting a lot of really great press in the media right now. But fermented foods, there's things like kombucha. I'm going to show you a picture. I drank mine earlier on today and I forgot to save my bottle. But this is what kombucha looks like. This is a particular brand. It does not have to be this brand by any means at all. The, the GT kombuchas are pretty, um, they're pretty popular, meaning that you can usually find them. Um, nowadays, you're finding them even in regular grocery stores. I know stores like Zares and Superstores, uh, as big chain stores are even carrying them. So that is a fermented tea. Now, if you look in the center, I love ginger more than life. Briar hates ginger, but in the end, I'm telling you guys, see the ginger aid? That is my love. It's my wrong love. I think it's the greatest thing in the entire world, and ginger is a really great aid in digestion in the first place. So a ginger aid kombucha, now you're getting your good, healthy bacteria, and you're getting the ginger, so that's a win-win all around. So kombucha is a fermented tea. So that's what it looks like if you ever see those, that term kombucha. Also, pickles, guys, sauerkraut is fermented cabbage. Now, fermented cabbage, I'm going to stop on that for just one second. Fermented cabbage is my love because now you're getting your – um, good, healthy bacteria, which is so fantastic because it's fermented. But what is even better is that you're getting some of the prebiotics in there as well. You are getting the food for your probiotics. You're, sorry, you're getting your food for your bacteria. So that's why it's almost like uh, sauerkraut, fermented cabbage. That is almost like a two-for-one. That is like, woo, double down on the sauerkraut. Love it. Okay. Miso is fermented soy. Um, a lot of times you'll see like a miso paste. Darn it, I have that in my kitchen as well. If you need me to go get it, check, or sorry, type in your chat box and I will go show you what miso looks like. But you can get it in like a tube kind of thing. Um, you 
squeeze it out. It has a very salty flavor to it. And um, you put it in soups and things like that. A lot of Asian soups carry call, call, for, call for miso. You will love it because it's flavorful. You can get um, some fermented yogurt. Also, there's kefir, which is fermented yogurt. Now, also, this is something that I think, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it in your screen. Okay, it does not have to be this brand. This is my apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is an amazing fermented food and it's going to help with your healthy gut. And I'm going to try to show you something, and I, I don't think you're going to be able to see it, but I'm going to try to get really close to the screen. Guys, can you see like a weird film along the bottom of that jar? This is what they call the mother bacteria. They use that for the fer fermentation process. You need that. If you buy an apple cider vinegar that is purified, you see it crystal clear, that, that doesn't have it. That's not going to have the same health properties as this apple cider vinegar. There's also a brand called Bragg's that you'll see quite, quite frequently in the grocery stores. This one here is um, a brand, I don't know if you guys can see that at all, but this brand here actually um, was like a quarter of the price of Bragg's, and I'm extremely cheap. So anyway, it was awesome. I talked to the health food store owner. She said it's the exact same as Bragg's, um, just a different brand. So anyways. Side note, but love my apple cider vinegar. So guys, apple cider vinegar you can utilize in um, salad dressings, but what I love to do is I take a cap full of that apple cider vinegar every single morning. I have that actually, I've got apple cider vinegar all throughout my house, but anyways, I have apple cider vinegar in my bathroom upstairs. I take a cap full of apple cider vinegar with water in the morning. I have that. I use apple cider vinegar with water as well as a toner for my face, I use coconut oil as my moisturizer, just saying. Um, actually, and I use baking soda. I should do a different webinar that teaches you how to kind of use household products for your, for your skin ritual. But anyways, I use baking soda um, onto, your, onto my skin with a little bit of coconut oil as an exfoliant. I don't want you to exfoliate every day, though, because then that's crazy, because you're taking off too much of the wonderful oil that's supposed to be, and the, and the bacteria again. You want to have a little bit of dirt. You don't want to be super duper clean because it's all the super duper, the over sanitization. It's the Purell hand sanitizers. Guys, you need your body to be able to fight and be able to see the bad foreign, foreign elements, the bad foreign bacteria and the bad foreign viruses in order to build a healthy immunity. And what has happened over the last Really, I would say over the last 10 years predominantly, it's become this like over sanitization world where it was antibacterial this, antibacterial soap, antibacterial hand sanitizer, put your hand underneath the thing, the antibacterial is all coming all over us. It's ridiculous. And what's happening is this, when we come in contact with a foreign agent, our body doesn't know what the heck to do with it because it's never seen it before. So there's something called, I'm getting on such a tangent right now, but there's something called the hygiene hypothesis. And back in the day, if you were from a family that had multiple children, maybe eight or nine children in the house, uh, you had a pet, you had a dog that's going outside and bringing in some other, you know, foreign agents into the house and not necessarily super duper clean, all of a sudden that person was, I should say healthier, but really healthier. They were able to fight off different bacteria that came in. They were not sick every day of their life. Um, you all, I think we all know those people that, you know, can kind of fight through anything and they, and their, their immunity is just unheard of. Their immunity is amazing. And I think we're losing that a lot. It's like with that over sanitization, we're killing off everything and then expecting our body to be so robust. When something comes in contact or, you know, someone else is coughing and sneezing on the maybe commuter train, going on, going on the commuter train to work, everyone's coughing and sneezing, and then we expect our bodies to be able to fight it off when we've never exposed ourselves to anything. So you do need a little bit of an exposure in order for your body to keep building up the antibodies and the immunity, and it's, you know, that's a tangent. But I would really love you to ditch those Purell's, ditch those, like, anti-sanitized, like, all of those hand sanitizers. Get rid of them. You know, washing your hands with soap and water. Wonderful. Um, there's a time to be sterile. Like, obviously, if you're having your leg amputated, you don't want this, 
you want to be a sterile environment, I get it. But I mean, like in your normal home and day-to-day -day usage and things like that, don't go overly crazy and, and it will make such a difference in your overall health. Okay, there's my tangent about the Purell. Now, prebiotics. Prebiotics are very different than probiotics. And I'm going to explain those to you. It's a question that comes up to us quite a bit. Now, my idea of trying to stick to the webinar to 30 or 40 minutes, I just looked down. I've totally blown that, so I'm going to keep trying to go fast, guys. A prebiotic is insoluble plant fiber. It is that plant fiber that I was saying before, the stringy plant fiber, the kale, the celery, the asparagus, the stringy plant fiber that really is um, undigested and then it is utilized by our bacteria to give it its food. So again, it is a healthy, healthy bacteria needs to eat and that's what it feeds on and that's what's gonna help it to multiply. And that's really what we're hoping to do. We want our healthy bacteria to keep populating over and over and over so that it keeps that nice healthy balance. Now, a probiotic is very different. A probiotic is living bacteria. So a probiotic, you might hear people these days saying, oh, you know, I, I have to take a probiotic or I'm helping, I'm helping my gut bacteria and I'm taking a probiotic. So what a probiotic is trying to do, if you have lost your gut bacteria due to those antibiotics that we were talking about before, so you lose your gut bacteria because you're, you just went through a dose of antibiotics and you're trying to repopulate or regrow your gut bacteria and you're really trying to build a stronger, good bacteria, you take probiotics. So that probiotics helps your digestive system and helps your helps your gut strength, I guess you would say, but it really helps to procreate and, and populate your gut bacteria. Now, this is what's crazy about probiotics, guys. There is like 10 billion probiotics on the market right now. Um, there is so many different, um, there's so many different products that sometimes it can seem so daunting to go, I don't even know what the heck I'm choosing and do I need to have a probiotic in the first place? If you have not been on antibiotics, if you are feeling like a million bucks, if you are feeling pretty strong in your, if you have not been on probiotics for, mul or sorry, if you have not been on antibiotics, or, or sorry, oh my gosh, antibiotics, courses of antibiotics over a long period of time, then you may, your gut bacteria is good. You feed it the prebiotics, you keep doing your fermented foods, you're gonna be good. Um, probiotics sometimes would be helpful if somebody is suffering from a lot of acne. If you or your children have a lot of acne, a probiotic might be beneficial. Also, if you have some autoimmune disease going on, probiotics might be beneficial because if you have an autoimmune disease, what's happening is your healthy gut bacteria, you are out of balance. Your bad bacteria is really fighting hardcore, and that's why a lot of times you could be kind of um, your immunity is attacking itself, and that's why they call it autoimmune. Autoimmune disease, guys, also means inflammation. Autoimmune disease means um, arthritis, it's the itises, it's the inflammation in the body. So if you're feeling very inflammatory, if you're feeling like your body on your inside, if you are popping ibuprofen all day long and have been in the past, you might want to consider taking a probiotic. So this question comes into a constant, constant, constant. If I have to take a probiotic, what should I be taking? Because again, there's so much confusing this going into a health food store because there's 10 billion on the shelf and now what the heck are you choosing? What I would love to suggest, first off, go talk to your health food store um, owner or, or a worker. They're gonna be pretty educated. Go in knowing a couple things first and then ask some questions when you get there. But when they talk about um, uh, colony forming units, CSU, what that means is that's how many billions of bacteria are in that one capsule. So a lot of times you'll take, you know, maybe one or two doses of, of probiotics per day. There's been conflicting information. Should I take probiotics on an empty stomach? Should I take probiotics after I just ate? What should I do? When should I take my probiotics? The research that's coming out right now is kind of um, – in between two theories right now, they're testing it out. Usually, it's on an empty stomach 
followed by food. So again, you can take it that way. Look at the bottle though. I don't want to just be generic and say that's the way you should take it. Look on the bottle, go off the directions that the bottle is telling you to do. But a 9 billion CFU would be wonderful and higher. So I would say kind of judge your 9 billion bacteria per capsule as uh, a really kind of broad, that's wonderful, that Dr. Robner's chooch can that I was talking about earlier, on her site, I think she even sells a probiotic, and it was like 50 billion CFUs. So the higher, I guess, the better. The higher, the better, but also, if you are new to a probiotic, it can cause sometimes a little bit of diarrhea and gas and bloating and things like that. So work your way up to it. So if you take a probiotic and you're like, man, I'm not feeling great, my stomach is not reacting to it well, then I would come down a little bit in your CFUs and um, kind of work your way up. But 9 billion and higher would be magnificent. Um, also, there's a couple different strands that I want to make sure that it includes if you are taking a probiotic. Two strands, acidophilus um, and B. bifidium. And those two are very important strands that I would love you to have. Um, also, there's going to be many different strands in there because the more strands, the better, guys. When it comes down to it, bacteria does not mean one strand. Bacteria has so many different types of bacteria. Guys, there's different strands of bacteria that's in your gut. There's all different strands in your gut. There's different strands of bacteria underneath your arms. There's different strands of bacteria in your mouth. There's all different varying strands. So I want you to get as much variety as possible, so make sure it has at least five different individual strands in there. Um, ideally, I would love to see 10 different strands in a probiotic. Guys, when it comes down to a probiotic, this is some interesting information. And I don't even know if I have this on a slide. I don't think I do. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, talk, um, I'm gonna talk about it on the next slide. When it comes to a probiotic, I don't want you to think, again, like I said, look back in your own health and your family's health and go, okay, have I been battling some, you know, taking quite a bit of antibiotic usage? Have I been uh, been put on tetracycline for acne? There's all these different types of, have I been taking a lot of anti-inflammatory drugs? Have I been taking a lot of ibuprofen over the years? And maybe your gut bacteria isn't that great. So you take your probiotic and you think you're doing something so magnificent and wonderful. Guys, when you take your probiotic, it will, what your, what your goal is or what you're hoping is that those bacteria make it, make it into your colon first or into your gut bacteria, or sorry, into your gut first. But number one, that's a task in itself. So you're hoping it makes it there. It only lives for roughly 20 to 30 minutes before it dies off. So in that window, which seems so ridiculously small, in that window, you're hoping that it repopulates itself. That's what the whole goal of a probiotic is in the first place. If it doesn't have the food, you got no hope in heck of it repopulating itself. So really, that's why the food component or the prebiotic component is something that I love to focus on even a little bit more than the probiotic component, even though they all work together. But the prebiotic component is so dire important. Also, the prebiotic, remember, that means it's indigestible plant fiber. It's fiber that your body cannot digest. So that's the food for your probiotic. That is the food for your bacteria. It's the food that it needs in order to procreate and help repopulate, repopulate, repopulate. So that's why I don't want you to go spend all these millions of dollars on a probiotic and then not be fueling yourself properly because that money that you just wasted on a probiotic is almost like doing yourself a disservice because you just spent all this money. So um, this last kind of quote, let thy food be thy medicine, and Hippocrates said it best. How can it get any better than that? Because it really is about food. And I know we talk about food so much, and I, we talk about food so, um, it's, it's, just, it's just, it drives everything. And when you are fueling yourself with the most optimal plant-powered fibrous foods, it's all of those things together that just, it just takes what you're doing and just steps it up tenfold. 
So again, it's removing a lot of those added sugars. It's having the whole foods, and that's why I can't be more in love with the challenge because that's what it is. It's challenge-friendly foods. Whole foods with no added sugar, and those two things together help with your, with your obviously, uh, making a healthy gut garden, but it also helps in stabilizing your blood sugar levels. It helps to give you energy, all of those great things. So guys, I know that was a lot of information, so my idea of trying to grasp all of this in <laughs> half an hour did not happen at all. Thank you so much for sitting in on this presentation. If you need to reach out to us, if you've got questions or further questions, please reach out to Briar I. Our contact information is there. We love to be with you. We love to support you and uh, help you in your journey on living the greatest challenge-friendly lifestyle that you possibly can. Mwah! That's all I got. Thank you so much for your time tonight, guys, and we'll see you soon.